Welcome to the Hills, all of you that are online and in person at North Richmond Hills Keller and West Fort Worth. Uh, Preacher Rick here and a couple of things. One, you can tell my voice is a little weak. I've been battling allergies all week. I promise you, I'm bringing you everything I've got right now. So do not interpret what I'm about to preach as lack of passion, because I believe deeply in the things I'm about to share. The second thing is I want to thank all of you that are participating in our 21 days of prayer. It's just a joy for me every morning to start and know I'm joining hundreds of other voices as play, praying in unity and specificity about something that applies to our vision. And there's still time for you to join us. Go to our website or check out nationsandgenerations.org and let's pray to the Father these next two weeks in one voice and see great things happen. So starting a new series today, this way. Can you recall an instance where someone experienced an unpleasant consequence because they treated a directive like an elective? And every parent here can say, yeah, that's my house every day. Uh, The doctor says, if you don't cut back on your alcohol and salt intake, you're going to have a stroke. And you treat it like a hint and not a command. And you have a stroke. The professor says the assignment is due on this date, no exceptions, and you walk in on that date and say, can I have a few more days, and you get an F. Or you go through security at the airport like I did just this past week, and someone got caught with a full water bottle, like that sign there that says you can't take those through security doesn't apply to you. We do this all the time. We treat directives like electives. I had permission from my wife to tell this story. Our first year of our marriage, we had a constant source of tension. She was always running out of gas. Now, this is before cell phones. She would have to pull the car to the side of the road, walk down the road, maybe half a mile to a convenience store, and call me and say, can you come get me? My car ran out of gas. And I had to say to her, do you see that dash? And do you see that big E there? And when the needle gets on E, that E does not stand for elective. Okay? That is a directive. Put gas in this car. And that doesn't happen anymore. Hardly ever. So (laughs) it's really important to be able to discern the difference between what is an instruction and what is just a suggestion. Or maybe another way to put it is it's really critical to know the difference between a maybe and a must, especially if you're following Jesus. Because many people today wear the label Christian, but they treat Jesus like he owns a cafeteria and he's put his, all his teachings on a buffet and you pick and choose the ones you must obey and the ones you might obey. And so we're going to spend a few weeks up to Harvest Sunday talking about not what Pastor Rick thinks is a must, but what Jesus said is a must if you're going to follow me. And you need to know that he lived this way. He lived his life out of a divine sense of necessity. Jesus didn't live guided by might. He lived guided by must. Let me show you this. In fact, the very first recorded words of Jesus. He's 12 years old. He's in the temple. He's been separated from his parents. They're trying to find him. Look at what he said. Why did you need to search? Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? As early as 12, he's living his life according to what he must do, not what he might do. He starts his public ministry. He starts preaching. In one town, a revival breaks out. His disciples want him to stay. Look what he said in Luke 4. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too. Because this is why I was sent. So he didn't live his life based on what the popular crowd wanted him to do, but what the father must do, what he must do to be faithful to the father's mission. Maybe the most important must statement of Jesus and the one the disciples pushed back against more than any other was this one. The son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. 
Jesus lived his life under the shadow of this divine must. That he was on a mission that would take him to a cross. One more, let me show you from John chapter 10. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there should be one flock and one shepherd. So Jesus lived to seek nations and generations. To fulfill God's promise to Abraham that all the nations would be blessed by him. I think you get my point. Jesus did not live his life by a sense of might, but by a sense of must. So it makes sense then, if you're following Jesus, that you're not driven by a sense of maybe. Or to put it another way, true discipleship embraces the mustness of life in Jesus. You cannot call Jesus Lord and treat his directives like they're just electives. You cannot call Jesus master and think his demands can be negotiated. A disciple is called to the life of the must, the expected, the necessary, the required. And don't send me an email, pastor, you're preaching legalism. No, I'm preaching surrender. Let me explain the difference. So Joseph Tan led a revival in Romania when the communists were kicked out. And Agent Rogers, well-known Baptist pastor from America, got to go and be a part of that. And he asked Joseph, what do you think about Christianity in America? And Joseph said, I'd rather not tell you. No, I want to hear. Well, you American Christians are really into commitment. And Agent Rogers said, that's a good thing. And he said, not really. Because commitment keeps you in control. You commit to uh, pray every day or to read your Bible or to lose weight or to make a mortgage payment or to stay married. And when you're tired, you decommit. But when somebody takes a gun and puts it to your head and says, put your hands up, you don't tell them what you're committed to. You surrender. Jesus has called us to a life of surrender. In other words, if you want to sign up for the Jesus life, the first thing you must do is give up your own. So we're, we have to start the series with this verse. There's no other way. The very first must that you must obey is this one. Just after Jesus said that he must die, he said this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his classic work, The Cost of Discipleship, said that when Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die. That Jesus did not depict the cross as a possibility, but as a necessity. That a personal cross for every disciple is a directive not an elective. And Jesus would make no exceptions. Jesus was never so desperate for recruits that he would water down his demands for people who did not want to invest that much. And they tried. Oh, Jesus, let me first go this. Let me first go that. Jesus would let people of power, people of wealth, people of status walk away because he wasn't going to change the terms. You must deny yourself and take up your cross daily. And I understand why it's hard for us to understand. Because after 2,000 years, the, the cross has become a symbol of beauty. We put it on church buildings. We make it jewelry. I get that. So for a moment, try to hear what Jesus' audience heard. When he said, you must take up a cross. Because nobody associated a cross with beauty. They had seen crosses. They had seen people carrying crosses. And they thought, you better take a good look at that person. You are never going to see them again. They are going to die. Jesus, what are you saying? Here's what he's saying. That life in Jesus starts with death. 
Well, what does that mean? Well, for some, then and now. It means being willing to accept the possibility of martyrdom. For Jesus' first disciples carrying a cross meant they all died. They made the choice. I'll stay loyal to Jesus instead of keeping my life. Christianity Today magazine estimates about 13 Christians a day are martyred right now around the world. And that's what it means for them to take up their cross. I will not deny Jesus even if it means it costs me my life. But let's be honest, for most of us, we're not going to make that choice. And I think Jesus knew that because he said, you must take up your cross daily. So I I think what Jesus understands is that for most of us, he's not talking about facing imminent death. He's talking about embracing a radically reoriented life. That the cross is more than a symbol of salvation. The cross is a model of a completely counter-cultural way of thinking and living. Jesus is calling me to live a crucified life every day. It's a must. So I'm trying in my mind to understand, well, how does that apply to me? How does that get real for me? What does a crucified life daily look like for me? So I want to share some thoughts with you. I think first that taking up a cross means he is greater than me. So you've heard people say, that's just my cross to bear. And typically it means some kind of hardship or sacrifice. And I get that. Maybe following Jesus means I need to drink less alcohol or I need to spend less time on screens or I need to live a simpler life so I have margin to give to kingdom causes. All that's good. But notice he did not say you must deny yourself things. He said you must deny your self. To take up a cross means I put to death the promotion of self. Do you understand how completely countercultural that is to the popular narrative of our days? Especially since about the 1960s, the predominant narrative of our culture is do you want to be happy? You do you. You promote you. You seek you. You express your self-sovereignty. You can't be happy if you let any limit, any tradition, any religion, any law, even your own biology, keep you from being who you want to do. And since the 1960s, our rates of loneliness, anxiety, depression have skyrocketed. And our rates of happiness have plummeted. As a nation, we've never been more unhappy with ourselves. Because the narrative we're buying isn't true. What amazing pressure we're putting on young people. You're not happy? That's because you don't do you right. What incredible pressure. And on top of that, here's a reason why that's always going to fail. You don't own a kingdom. The world is constantly going to frustrate your pursuit of self-sovereignty because nobody else recognizes your kingdom. You and I were born into a kingdom. We are extras in a movie that is not about us. And Jesus came to deliver us from Meville. And here's the thing, it's so liberating. Because if my daily purpose is not to promote me, but to promote Jesus. Do you understand? Nothing can frustrate my purpose. No defeat, no setback, no disease, no diagnosis, no enemy. Nothing can happen tomorrow. I'll be in no situation where in that moment, I can't look at how to exalt Jesus. 
And so I need to live like John the baptizer. He must become greater. I must become less. I am in a movie titled Jesus is Lord. And every day I pick up a cross to keep the plot of the movie from getting hijacked. That's what it means. We die daily to the promotion of self and to the ambition for power. So if I haven't stepped on your toes yet, I'm about to. (laughs) Because taking up a cross means under is better than over. See, power is so seductive. And power is so addictive. And it's so easy to convince ourselves the goal is just to make sure the right people have power. So everybody else will be what we want to be. This is the temptation Satan offered Jesus. I'll give you every kingdom of the world. And Jesus could have thought, look at all the good I could do in the world if I had all the power. And the great lie is that we're going to change the world from the top down. It's the old paradigm. It's what the crowds wanted Jesus to do. Go be king. Make everybody be what you want. It's what the disciples wanted. They were following someone they thought was going to become the next king. But Jesus doesn't change the world from the top down. He changes the world from the bottom up. And he said it was a must for his disciples to get that. Because they were always arguing about who's going to be in charge. Always arguing over who's going to be over. By the way, we do too. Most of our fights in our family, in the church, and in our government are over who's going to be over. And here's what Jesus said to that. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. And said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. All right, let me just go ahead and say it. Knowing a few emails may come my way. The data says one reason a lot of young people are walking away from Christian faith today is because they're seeing the older generation so desperate for political power, they will completely jettison core Christian character values in order to get it. This is not the way of Jesus. Listen close. The way of the cross is not to force Christianity on other people. The way of the cross is to force other people to acknowledge that nobody loves and serves more selflessly than Christians do. I love this illustration about Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson. Both were strong Christian men. Ricky was the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. He was looking to break the color barrier in Major League Baseball. He knew it took a special person to do it. So he picked Jackie Robinson. Not just because he was a phenomenal baseball player, but he was a strong follower of Jesus. And they had a hard talk before he offered a contract. Because Ricky told Robinson what kind of abuse and vitriol he was going to face if he walked onto a major league field. And Robinson said, you mean you want a guy that doesn't have the guts to fight back? Ricky said, no, I want a guy who has the guts not to fight back. Because if you curse back, all they'll hear is your curse. If you swing back, all they'll see is what you did. He went straight to the Gospels and said, like Jesus, I need you to play well on the field and turn the other cheek. Can you do that? And Robinson said, you give me a uniform and I'll give you the guts. You ever notice that Jesus never played the God card? He never used power to lift himself up. He only used it to lift other people up. See, the power of the cross is the power of sacrificial love. And the the kingdom of darkness has no answer for that. No way to respond to that. But it's hard to let go of the ambition for power 
in a culture that is absolutely obsessed with winning. And so, the, for me at least, the third thing taking up a cross means is that to lose is stronger than win. And oh my goodness, we love to win. We'd rather win than be right. Like the couple arguing. And it got so tense, they gave each other the silent treatment. I mean, all week long, both the man and the woman were too proud to say I'm sorry and reconcile. Well, it's Sunday night. He's got to get up early the next morning to catch a a flight. He's a heavy sleeper. Instead of apologizing, he's too proud. He just leaves a note on the bedside, on her side of the bed. Please wake me up at 5 a.m. He wakes up at 9 a.m. the next day. He is furious. He is going to find her and chew her out. Then he sees a note on his bed stand. It's 5 a.m. Wake up. (laughs) And that's how we live because we would rather win than be right. Please understand, the very first disciples joined the Jesus movement because they thought they were following a winner. He is going to go set up a kingdom. He is going to kick these Romans out. When Jesus said, I must die, Peter said, not so, Lord. Uh Uh-uh. We're on our way to a coronation, not a crucifixion. But Jesus' agenda was not to march on Jerusalem and conquer. It was to march to Jerusalem and suffer. And so when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter wanting so badly to win, pulled out a sword and actually attacked the man, chopped off his ear. Jesus put it back on. And he said this, put your sword in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call him my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? I must lose. Not win. He modeled a way of living that hinged on losing the right way and for the right reason. He said, take up your cross and do that too. You understand, there's a big difference between losing and choosing to lose. Somebody hurts you. And you have the capacity to hurt back, but you choose to lose. Turn the other cheek. Somebody curses you, and you're good with words. You could curse them back and dominate the conversation, but you choose to lose and bless them instead. Somebody wounds you you. And they say, I'm sorry. And you're not sure they mean it. You're not sure they won't do it again, but you choose to lose and say, I forgive you. You think it's easy to live this way? Our flesh wants to say, no, they don't deserve it. No one's taking advantage of me. I'm not getting pushed around. And every day we're tempted to abandon Jesus' way of must and say, I'll decide when it's maybe. And that's why a disciple must have a very different definition of what when is. So back to Joseph Tan. He left Romania in 1972 to study theology in England. He wanted to go back home. His friend said, you go back home, they will kill you. He prayed about it. The Lord put Matthew 10 on his heart. I send you back as a sheep among wolves. What chance does the sheep have? If you won't go back that way, don't go. So he went back. He was uh, constantly under harassment, imprisonment, sometimes torture. One time he's... In captivity, and a guard pulls out a gun, puts it to his head, and said, we could just kill you right now. 
Joseph Thompson, go ahead. You know my sermons are on tapes all over this country, and you'll sprinkle them with blood. People will listen ten times more because they know I died for what I preach. So you just go ahead and kill me. I get the supreme victory then. They didn't know what to do with him. They finally exiled him because they thought he's less of a problem out the country than in the country in prison. He wrote, all those years I was trying to save my life and I was losing it. When I was finally ready to lose my life, I realized I saved it. It's hard to intimidate somebody who's already dead. And maybe that's why Jesus said, start your life with me with something called baptism. Think about it. It's not the end of disciple. It's the starting point. Why? You publicly declare to everyone watching, I'm going to live a crucified life. The first thing I'm going to do is die with Jesus. Because I think living a crucified life with Jesus is how to be fully alive. That's why we're going to have Baptism Sunday next week. You need to be praying about it. Jesus is calling you to come die with him. If you're going to follow Jesus, death is a must. And I get it. If you're not sure who Jesus is, this is nonsense. Why would anybody want to live this way if this world is all there is? But a follower must trust there's life after death. That nobody crucified with Christ stays dead. In fact, what Jesus is trying to do, he's trying not to lead us so much into a grave. He's trying to lead us out of a grave. So look what he said in John 12. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servant must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. You follow Jesus, you will wind up at a cross just like he did. And that's where the Father will find you and give you great honor. And you will save your life for eternity. Jesus never promised a disciple comfort. He promised his disciples glory. And it's not a maybe. His promise is a must. And if you could remember that every day, you could take up your cross every day. Let me be vulnerable because I ask myself, what does this mean for me? You see, I'm a minister. I have been for a long time. Ministers like people. The shadow side is we like to be liked by people. And so when I was a young preacher, I really battled approval addiction. I wanted people to like me. And when I heard that people didn't, it crushed me or it angered me. And I had this huge desire to defend myself and to fight and to win. That's a miserable way to live. I heard an old preacher one time say, if somebody kicks you and it hurts, it just means you're not dead yet. (laughs) Dead people, never mind. And I realized I need to live a more crucified life. And I've been trying. And I've been growing. The Spirit has been helping me. I'm not living for comfort. I'm living for glory. And if the Father says, well done, what does it matter what anyone else says about me? And so, recently, someone told me about another person that said some very slanderous things about me a few years back that caused a bunch of people to think bad thoughts of me. And that would have really upset me years ago. And it didn't. It didn't at all. I felt no need to defend. In fact, my first response was to pray for the person that said it and bless them. I'm trying to learn to live the crucified life. And I'm telling you, it is so much more liberating when you're dead. (laughs) 
And that's what Jesus says you must do. So, is Jesus Lord or not? And the answer can't be sometimes. The answer can't be, well, it depends on the situation. Sometimes he's a must. Sometimes he's a maybe. No. Every day, you take up your cross. Every day is going to present you in your life where you live, in your home and your school and your job and your neighborhood. Every day is going to present you with an opportunity and a decision. Am I going to choose the Jesus way? And my counsel is to take up your cross and discover that dying is absolutely the most exhilarating way to live. The death is a must, and it's the best. So, I'm going to pray over you, and here's why. This is the kind of sermon that can be real esoteric, real ethereal, but it needs to get practical. What does it mean in very real life ways? For you to be a more crucified follower of Jesus in your home, among friends, with people you don't like. What does it mean? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray the Holy Spirit will tell you what that means. So bow with me. There's no one size fits all response to this sermon God but every person listening to me right now has a unique way they could be more dead show them what that is show them where they have been slow to pick up a cross and give us greater confidence To believe that living dead is actually the most alive way to live. Help us follow Jesus, even to the cross. Because on the other side of that cross, there's an empty tomb. We pray in your name. Amen.